So we have uh, three presentations. We'll go in uh, alpha, sort of alphabetical order. When you have co-authors, it's very tricky. <laughs> <laughs> so to start with uh, Bertolt Ross uh, uh, from the uh, University of Virginia, and then uh, Leila Nadja Sadat from Washington U uh, School of Law, and then Reva Siegel from Yale and Joseph Locker from uh, Duke. Um, so, uh, um, Ber uh, Bertrand Ross, can you start? I don't. Okay. Sure thing. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, am I too? I hope I'm not too loud and blasting your ears off. Um, I want to um, start by. Oh my God! Big screen. That's scary. Uh, <laughs> start by um, thanking um, Jake Charles from the Duke Center of Firearms Law. The Harvard Law School and the Harvard Law Review for the opportunity to join you virtually from Berlin. And thank my co panelists and moderator, um, Reva, Leila, Joseph, and Mark. Now, in my presentation, I want to advance two claims. My first claim is that the Second Amendment right to bear arms is unique, distinct from any other Anglo American constitutional provision that came before it. My second claim is that the Second Amendment's uniqueness arose from a new concern about economic class based oppression due to the political inequality embedded in the U.S. Constitution. So let me start with my first claim, that the Second Amendment right to bear arms is unique. This claim is supported by both a text analysis of, a, of constitutional provisions that came before the Second Amendment and historical accounts derived from other scholars. The Second Amendment is not the first Anglo-American constitutional provision to protect the right to bear arms. The English Declaration of Rights, codified after the late 17th century glorious revolution, protected the right of certain Englishmen, Protestants, to bear arms. And three of the American Revolutionary Era constitutions, North Carolina, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania, protected the right to bear arms as well. Notably, the ten, ten of the other original states did not adopt constitutional protections for the right to bear arms, nor did the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which is considered a sort of constitution that Congress passed for the territories that comprise the current day Midwest of our country. In looking abroad, France and this Declaration of Rights of Man, adopted in 1789, did not contain a right to bear arms either. And finally, of course, the U.S. Constitution itself did not originally contain a right to bear arms. As an initial matter, that raises the question that was sidelined here, which is what explains the choice to adopt or not to adopt the right to bear arms. But even accounting for those state constitutional omissions, one might still consider the right to bear arms in the English Declaration of Rights and North Carolina, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania Constitution to be precedents for the Second Amendment. However, once one looks closer to the text and history of the right to bear arms that preceded the Second Amendment, any superficial similarities start to fade. The English Declaration of Rights contained a catalog of rights protected um, from infringement by the Crown. It did not apply at all to the Parliament, which included the people's representatives in the House of Commons. The right to bear arms in North Carolina, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania appeared to apply to the state legislatures, but the constitutional provisions limited the right to specific purposes, the defense of the state and public safety. The North Carolina and Massachusetts Constitution clearly specified that the right to bear arms is for the common defense. The Pennsylvania Constitution is a little more ambiguous in providing the people with the right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the states and the state. However, excellent and thus far uncontradicted historical work from Professor Nathan Kozik Kanich um, clearly demonstrates to me at least that the language defense by themselves not refer to private self-defense as the court suggested in Heller, but rather public safety. History also suggests that the right to bear arms in Pennsylvania, perhaps North Carolina, and Massachusetts are better understood as imposing a duty on the people to bear arms for the protection of the state at times when standing armies and other state organized forms of protection were disfavored. Notably, there is nothing in the state declaration of rights prohibiting state legislatures from infringing on the rights. Arguably, the early state declaration of rights were best understood as instructions to the people's representatives in the state legislatures, not binding prohibitions in the form of the U.S. Constitution's Bill of Rights. <coughs> The Second Amendment deviates from the right to bear arms that came before and that is specifically applies to the people's representatives in Congress. It includes specific language not contained in the other right to bear arms that the right shall not be infringed. Furthermore, although an early draft of the Second Amendment, um, um, similar to the early, early state constitutions, narrowed the right to the specific purpose of the common defense, the final draft contained no such limitation. Instead, the amendment includes an awkward preamble that does not contain any clear limits on the operative clause's right to bear arms. The Second Amendment right to bear arms is thus distinct from other rights to bear arms that came before it. Unlike prior constitutional rights to bear arms, it provides a right to bear arms for any purpose that is protected from infringement by the people's representatives in Congress. 
That leads to the second claim arising from the obvious follow-up question of why the unique Second Amendment. So to understand the choice regarding the Second Amendment, it is necessary to understand the evolving political dynamics between the American Revolution and the ratification of the Bill of Rights. The early state constitutions were adopted during a historical moment characterized by the revolutionary democratic spirit that prized unity. A notion of democratic unity that glossed over any class divisions was derived from British theory of politics that the Americans embraced and sought to modify for their own circumstances. According to the mixed theory of, this mixed theory of government, a sustainable republic is divided into three estates, each representing the different orders of society with the power to check each other. In England, those estates were the monarchy representing the crown, the aristocracy representing the House of Lords, and the democracy representing the House of Commons. Although comprising several different classes of people for political purposes, the democracy was considered a homogenous, unitary entity. The democracy did not recognize or represent any particular class of people. It just represented the people. For the American revolutionaries, this mixed government represented the ideal constitutional framework for a sustainable republic. Now, although Amer the Americans would need to make adjustments in their frame of government to account for the fact that there would be no king or hereditary aristocracy in America, they fully embraced the idea of three estates and the unity within the three estates. One adjustment that the Americans made out of fear of executive power arising from their experience with King George III was to make the democracy, through one or both branches of the state legislatures, the center point of political power. And the Americans in their state constitution sought to ensure that representatives in the state legislatures remained tethered to the people due to their short terms in office, mandatory rotations out of office, and relatively low property qualifications for voters and representatives. Perhaps the most important of the innovations that is often neglected was the establishment of large state legislatures, so that each legislator represented a relatively small number of people limited to specific towns or counties. The idea being that the representatives should be of the people and connected to the people, having, and having them govern a small number of people would advance those goals. The early American model of representation was inspired by the writings of John Adams and his thoughts on government, published in 1776. He famously wrote that the legislature should be in miniature, an exact portrait of the people at large. It should think, feel, reason, and act like them. Democratic unity was further reinforced by a common enemy as a war against the British operated in the background of revolutionary era political developments. The early state declaration of rights were written in this context. The Anglo-American popular concern about tyranny that focused on the actions of the crown in a parliament that did not include any Americans seemed moot when it came to the new state government. Americans inspired by the idea of democratic unity considered the representatives of state government to be the people themselves. Such representatives who were the people would therefore suffer the same consequences from any tyrannical government action. The Declaration of Rights did not therefore appear to be motivated by fear about potential tyrannical infringement of rights, which explains why half the new states didn't even bother to adopt the Rights Declaration at all. Irrelevant here, the right to bear arms was not included to provide the people with protection from tyrannical government. Rather, as said in the text of the constitutions, they were intended to provide unitary people with self-defense against common enemies. The dominant revolutionary ideal of democratic unity began to break down after the, revolution, after the Revolutionary War, which brought with it the onset of a deep economic depression. Nothing highlights extreme economic inequality more than the Depression, and the Depression of the early and mid-1780s was no different in that respect. During the Depression, many economically overextended Americans were deep in debt, as speculators and creditors took advantage of economic conditions to further enrich themselves. A division emerged between the mass of American debtors and the minority of American creditors. The debtors demanded that their representatives, representatives in the state legislatures um, 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 provide debt relief um, through the issuance and required acceptance of paper money as a legal tender to facilitate, facilitate debt payment. Creditors opposed debt relief and paper money, fearing that the value of paper money would not be commensurate to the metal specie that they expected as repayment for the debt, for the credit. State legislatures tend to be responsive to the demands for the, of the broader democratic mass, masses, and when they weren't, as in the case of Massachusetts, the people rebelled and were ultimately suppressed, and ultimately the people secured their legislation nonetheless. The creditors, who included revolutionary era economic elites, were horrified at seeing the consequences of what they disparagingly labeled democracy. The letters between the economic elites highlight the emergence of class divisions and class consciousness. Americans were no longer just Americans, they were instead the rich and the poor, the creditors and the debtors, the merchants and the mechanics, the large landholders and the small landholders. These class divisions had always existed, but during the Depression, they became much more salient because they had become politically relevant in ways that they were not before. The mass of the poor debtor mechanic smallholder classes 
Small landholder classes were able to secure a favorable legislative result at the expense of the wealthy creditor merchant and large landholding elite. For the rich, those legislative results were evidence of the excess of democracy. And their response was a plan to take power away from the democratic state legislatures and place it in a, in a federal government that would be controlled by them and other members of the economic elite. That, more than the concern about the weakness of the Continental Congress and the Articles of Federation, was the motivation for the transformation of the constitutional framework and the constitutional convention. The first move in the constitutional convention was to structure government in a way that would ensure elite domination of the federal government. The constitutional proponents, who I would label federalists for purposes of simplicity, knew that they could not secure ratification of the constitution that did not accord with the broad outlines of the mixed form of government. But when, within those broad outlines, the federalists shifted power from the democratic branch to the more aristocratic senate and executive branch that would not be subject to direct elections by the people. The federalists also restructured the democratic branch so they would be less democratic. The restructuring of the democratic branch, the House of Representatives, is often overlooked in the accounts of the Constitution because it was rather subtle, but effective in achieving its purpose. The Federalists, the Federalists knew that they could not secure the Constitution's ratification with the democratic branch that was not directly elected by the people. But some of the convention sought to establish property qualifications for voting that would have narrowed the class of people who get, get to vote in federal elections. But the convention members could not reach an agreement on federal voter qualifications. They therefore shifted to the strategy of creating a small House of Representatives, with each member of the House representing a large swath of voters. In the Federalist plan, the House of Representatives contained 65 members who would be responsible for representing 3 million, about 3 million Americans. That high representative to population ratio can be contrasted with that in England at the time, where 558 members, almost 10 times the number of members of the House of Representatives, in the English House of Commons represented about 7 million English people, only a little bit more than twice the number of Americans. The high representative to population ratio in the House of Representatives can also be contrasted with the much lower representative to population ratio established in the states to ensure that the representative was of the people and attached to the people. The proponents of the Constitution did not want representatives of the people. They wanted representatives of who were part of a natural aristocracy, which they defined as independent and virtuous Americans. Since it was assumed that only those with reputation and wealth would be able to win elections in the large election districts, the natural aristocracy came to be associated with the economic elite. The proponents of the Constitution also did not want representatives to be too attached to the people because of the threat that the people posed to the property and the wealth of the elite. After restructuring the government, the Federalists provided in the Constitution for Congress to have expanded powers, including the power to tax, raise and support armies, regulate commerce, and prohibit states from impairing obligation of contracts a clear stop to the creditors. For the opponents to the Constitution, who I label here the anti-federalists, the Constitution did not establish a republic in the traditional sense of a mixed form of government with democracy at the forefront. Instead, it established an aristocracy that political theory had taught them that would inevitably evolve into an oligarchy that would oppress the people. In their opposition to the Constitution's ratification, they sought to reopen deliberations in the Constitution to shift the power back to the states. Leading the campaign against the Constitution were two different sets of anti-federalists with two different motives. One class of anti-federalists sought to shift power back to the states for their own personal reasons. As members and leaders of state legislatures, they stood to lose out from the shift of power to the federal government. Another class of anti-federalists sought to return power to the state, um, to the state legislatures to check the power of the aristocracy. The most politically effective aspect of the anti-federalist platform was their criticism of the Constitution's proponents' failure to include a Bill of Rights. But the proposal for a Bill of Rights not only served the purpose of mobilizing support for reopening the Constitutional Convention, it also included means by which the democracy could protect itself from potential government tyranny arising from the predicted aristocratic oppression of the people. The Bill of Rights, and particularly the Second Amendment, provide the people with critical tools to defend themselves from such class-based oppression arising from a federal government intent on excluding the poor and building sort. It was thus a political inequality that the Federalists intentionally embedded into the Constitution that gave rise to the sense of need for a federal Bill of Rights and the Second Amendment in particular. So why does this matter now? If this historical account is right, then one implication is that it should complicate constitutional doctrine. The application of the Second Amendment and other rights contained in the Bill of Rights to state action should include an assessment of a variable that has thus far been omitted. In constitutional law, doctrine, the constitutional law, um, the state authority to regulate a right often turns on the degree of infringement, the strength of state purpose for the regulation, and the relationship between the regulation and the state purpose. If, however, we understand the Second Amendment and other rights as being responsive to an anti-Republican frame of government, 
that part of the consideration should include whether the framework government operates in ways that provide for the inclusion and empowerment, and, and empowerment of the people themselves. Whether, in the words of John Adams, the legislature is <coughs> an exact portrait of the people at large that thinks, feels, reasons, and acts like that. If the legislature has achieved that representative ideal, then it might suggest that the legislature should be given more leeway to regulate in ways that fit rights protected in the Constitution. It might suggest, for example, the courts should lessen the state's state burden of defending the law. Such an approach might lead to favorable developments in democratic politics as well. For example, by holding out the possibility that states might have greater constitutional leeway in the laws that they pass, they might be incentivized to structure a more Republican form of government that is inclusive with more classes of Americans, of Americans than now are included in both the state and federal governments. These are just some of the implications arising from a reconstruction of the origins of the Bill of Rights and the Second Amendment, with many more to explore. Thanks for your time, and I look forward to the conversation. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, now we're uh, going to get a, a somewhat rather different perspective from we hope. Uh, the international uh, community. Unless, do you want to go to your paper next? Because it ties, okay. And we're hoping that the PowerPoint will actually cooperate. Okay, let's try to share this. Hi, everybody. Okay. Um, yes, I think it's going to work. Yes, okay. Uh, yes. Success. <laughs> Success. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much to the Harvard Law Review and to the Duke Center um, for inviting me. I'm Leila Sadat. I'm a professor at Washington University in St. Louis, and I am not a constitutional law scholar. I am a human rights and international criminal law advocate, and I'm really grateful to the for the opportunity to intersect with the important work that I've heard so far with the papers that you're going to hear later, um, because I do think that a human rights perspective or a different perspective is another way to help think about what's obviously a really difficult problem in our society. And as many of you have sort of origin stories about how did you get involved in thinking about the Second Amendment, my origin story was um, the Las Vegas shooting, which was horrific and splashed across our television screens in, in the mass slaughter that we all could see. And the newspaper reporting on that was all about whether or not gun regulation could have prevented it, right? Whether the Second Amendment rights uh, and the Second Amendment itself would have allowed somehow some kind of regulation. And the only thing I could think of is a, as a human rights lawyer was what about all the other human rights? It's not just about the Second Amendment. It's about a whole bunch of other things. And so I embarked on a process, um, a project called Gun Violence and Human Rights. And one of the things that we tried to do, as you heard in some of the earlier work, was actually survey the literature. My university already had a public health project that was looking at gun violence because St. Louis and Missouri, as we have already heard, is a part of the epicenter of, of a gun violence problem in the United States. And you can see from these statistics that it's a pretty extraordinary problem. And in a symposium about inequality, we can see people of color women and children are particularly hit hard by gun violence. Um, the majority of gun owners are men by uh, a factor of about two to one, and they are white by a significant factor. And so if you look at gun violence from a public health perspective, sort of the doctors are running to stitch people up and try to figure out what to do, and the community-based intervention is working. But you can also look at it, um, as I do, because I work so much globally, um, uh, from an international perspective. And the United States is pretty stark in how big an outlier it is in terms of gun violence. One reason is, as Bertrand Ross just pointed out, it's very unusual to have anything resembling the Second Amendment in your Constitution. Uh, there are only 15 countries in the world that have anything like it, and most of them have clear restrictions. The United States is an outlier that way, but it's also a country that's awash in guns. And that is equally unusual. You know, we've successfully tackled other public health crises. Why can't we manage gun violence? Well, all the international institutions tell us that the big problem is guns. 
and yet the United States seems absolutely unable to address the fact that there are tens of thousands of deaths every year and many, many more injuries. So um, when I started working at the, on this, we had a, a conference and we invited Philip Alpers, who was the lead sort of gun violence advocate from Australia. Australia had had a terrible mass shooting. They had decided to get rid of assault weapons and to have a huge gun buyback problem. It was a very, very difficult problem for them. And all the social science research tells us that the more guns you have, the more killings you have and the more wounding you have. So um, uh, anyway, that, that's his take. This particular project that I'm sharing with you today is a small offshoot of a much larger project that looked not at all of the rights, but at many, many of the rights. And you should know that the, the first part of it was sort of establishing the public health and sociological reality. The second part was the legal framework. And as part of that, we testified um, in front of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. I presented a report to the Human Rights Council, to the uh, Human Rights Committee, and to UN bodies that have dealt with the US gun violence problem as a human rights problem, not within the confines of the Second Amendment. But I'll come back to how this can relate e even in US litigation. This piece of it here is about um, kids, and it's about school shootings. And the reason I focused on school shootings is not that they're the largest percentage of the problem with respect to the U.S. gun violence crisis, but because kids are in state custody. So if you're a human rights lawyer and you start thinking about where are the obligations of the state most significant, it is often with respect to individuals in custody, either in prisons or somewhere else, and also because they're young, they're vulnerable, and there are about 75 million of them in the United States. So it's still a very large community. Um, they've become an extraordinarily significant occurrence. And one of the contentions that I did in a very, very large paper that was supposed to be submitted to the torture committee, except we're a little out of cycle, was to argue that the US failure to regulate, failure to restrict, and failure to protect students was actually a violation of the torture convention. And that may sound shocking. Uh, it's meant to shock because, in fact, the degree of violence that is out there is shocking. But obviously, you can't make contentions without backing them up. And so what we did is we looked at the medical literature, the psychological literature, and the social science literature to look at levels of PTSD, trauma, and responses of students who have witnessed school shootings or who are subjected to things like like active shooter drills or other uh, government restrictions. So I'm not going to go through all of those, but essentially it's, for those of us who have kids, we know this pretty well, but school shootings are really trauma, trauma, uh, trauma, traumatic, excuse me, to, to children. And it uh, gives them a fear of school. They have to attend school by law. They can be homeschooled, obviously. You can pull your kids out and put them in a private school or homeschool them. But nonetheless, most states have requirements that young children have uh, mandatory education. And the government responses, ironically, in the United States tend to make the problem worse. Because what we see is that after every mass shooting, the typical response is to actually loosen gun laws rather than strengthen gun laws. And I'm sure other folks have, have more insight into why that's true. But uh, even with re respect to the Parkland shooting, where you had a group of very vocal, very articulate, very active uh, high school students who were trying to get the Florida legislature to fix, essentially, what they saw were problems that had led to the slaughter of 17 of their classmates, um, the government actually didn't do anything other than impose clear backpack rules. Um, my sense with the Second Amendment jurisprudence coming at this, again, from a human rights perspective, not inside the US constitutional system, but outside and in relationship to the United States Constitution, is you can't just focus on the Second Amendment. You have to read it in conjunction with other rights. The Second Amendment, as well, is deeply contested even within the United States. You have various iterations of um, people talking about text and history and interpretation, and it's current interpretation is aggravating, not addressing inequality. And I really like the work of Carol Anderson on this, where she says that the Second Amendment is so inherently structurally flawed, so based on black exclusion and debasement, that unlike the other amendments, it can never be a pathway to civil and human rights. And I think that's a challenge for um, the, the public defender's brief, actually, that I think um, Joseph and Reva are going to talk about. 
So my argument is that guns don't actually have rights. When we talk about gun rights, it's a very strange kind of locution. Guns don't have rights, people have rights. And in addition to public health strategies, what else can we do? I'm not gonna go, all of you at Harvard Law School know this, but still it's worth pointing out that treaties are part of the supreme law of the land under Article Six of the Constitution, and that <clears throat> under the Paquette de Havana, at least if this particular Supreme Court doesn't write it out of, out of everything, uh, international law as customary international law is part of United States law. So which treaties has the United States ratified that are part of the supreme law of the land? The UN Charter, the Charter of the OAS System, the International Covenant on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the ICCPR, the Torture Convention, and the Constitution of the World Health Organization. And I think over the last year or a few years, we've seen how important these international institutions are in other respects. There are other relevant treaties that the United States may have signed but not ratified. That means we're bound to respect the object and purpose but not bound to comply uh, with each specific provision including the UN Arms Trade Treaty, the Inter-American Convention Against Illicit Manufacturing, the Women's Convention, the Cultural, Economic, and Social Rights Convention, and the Convention on the Rights of the Trial. The United States Convention, the United States Constitution, is a global outlier in another sense. We don't have a right to life. Well, or the right to life ends at birth, basically, in, in the United States uh, under some political um, interpretations. Most international instruments and uh, constitutions have a right to life. And the right to life, to the extent that there is a hierarchy of norm, is considered the preeminent right. It's a non-derogable right. It's a use Kogan's right under the, um, the jurisprudence of the human rights bodies. It's the premier object of government is to provide for life, security, and happiness. Some of the other rights that are implicated by gun violence that you'll hear about in, in Reva and Joe's paper and in their earlier work, actually, security of person, health, participation in cultural life, discrimination, expression, religion, freedom of association, and the right to vote and participate in cultural and in political life. And the one I focus on in my contribution to this symposium, symposium is freedom from torture and ill treatment, special protection for children and education. So one of the challenges of the human rights regime when it hits the 18th century United States Constitution is that human rights law imposes affirmative obligations on government, not just negative obligations. So it's not just a right to be free from interference with your Second Amendment rights. Governments have obligations of due diligence to ensure the protection of all the rights. So my thesis with respect to the torture committee is that the level of trauma and the level of government one could say negligence, absence of due diligence with respect to school shootings has actually, uh, actually amounts to ill treatment, not torture. That, that's probably a, a too broad a, an argument, but amounts to ill treatment under the torture convention. Um, and you can see that when you look at the convention itself, torture has uh, a requirement of certain bad behavior to elicit a specific purpose. Um, so it's you torture somebody to get a confession or you torture them for some reason. That's not true of ill treatment, where the ill treatment doesn't have to be linked to a specific purpose. And so my argument is that the consent or acquiescence of public officials, which is very interesting in terms of the paper we heard this morning about the public-private, whether we've actually delegated to the private sector um, uh, public safety, that would be considered actionable under human rights law. Um, so our argument, and my argument in this particular paper, is that the state have a special obligation that the US reservations to the torture convention don't prevent it from applying as law, as an Article uh, Two treaty, um, and an Article Six Supreme Treaty. And finally, we can't use our federal system as non-compliance. So where do you go with this? I think that's sometimes the frustration for the US lawyer. Since I work a lot in the international space, I know where to, you know, why am I doing this? It's because you're trying to get allies outside the United States and authoritative jurisprudence outside the United States that potentially you could use as advocacy or to inform campaigns in the United States, assuming you see the scourge of gun violence as an issue, as I do. So these are a list of some of the organizations. As I said, we've been active in petitioning them, in addition to organizations like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, NGOs. Um, the High Commissioner for Human Rights has been speaking out 
this is a former High Commissioner, Prince Zaid of Jordan, but he was particularly uh, articulate with respect to some of the mass shootings. He, he lives in the United States. He was Jordan's permanent representative for a long time. And again, the fact that other countries are able to do this through sensible gun laws, the fact that even within the United States, you can see that where you have stronger gun safety laws, you have fewer deaths and injuries, shows that there is actually a pretty decent case for causation, not just correlation, but that gun safety laws actually produce results. And you see that especially in the UK, Australia, other countries that really tighten their laws after mass shootings. Um, the Inter-American Commission has been working on that, and that's a very interesting, uh, we, we petitioned in front of them, I won't go through some of the other ones. It, the United Nations Human Rights Council has spoken to the United States repeatedly on the issue of guns, not so much the school shooting, but mostly in the context of racial discrimination and over-policing. Michael Brown's family from Ferguson, Missouri, went to the um, Geneva to petition the human rights bodies about the killing of Michael Brown. So why should the United States comply at all? And here I'm just going to give a tiny thumbnail of some of the sort of legal strategies. Where do you take this advocacy, assuming I'm right, right? Assuming these are violations of human rights law. Well, states comply because they want to have a good reputation. They want to exercise leadership. There's reciprocity. We saw the Biden administration's response to the Universal Periodic Review, very different, obviously, than the Trump administration's response, very responsive to many of the criticisms. Um, can you actually incorporate in this, this in US law? This is where I'm going to sort of end my presentation on just a few notes. Obviously, where you have a charter of negative rights, it's much more difficult to get to affirmative due diligence obligations. States under human rights law have obligations to respect, to ensure, to protect, to undertake. Those are clear obligations. Other states have to comply with them. If you think of the European Court of Human Rights, it issues binding orders all the time, binding judgments to states. We're in a non-binding regime because the United States has not ratified the American Convention that would subject it to to the binding jurisdiction of a human rights court, but the obligations are the same. In federal courts, we come up against a lot of obstacles to using this kind of law. Sovereign immunity, political question, non-self-execution in the Medellin case, um, US reservations and declarations, attitudes. Honestly, part of it is just attitudinal. Then you have the Castle Rock Doctrine, which brings me back to the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. This was a case that you might be familiar with in which Jessica Lenahan Gonzalez's uh, children were killed by her former um, husband, who was under a protective order. And she had gone to the police and tried to get enforcement. And the children were killed by him. She brought cases through the US federal courts. And in uh, the Castle Rock versus Gonzalez case, the Supreme Court said, you know, no substantive due process rights to uh, protect life, liberty, and property. Very disappointing result. And so she went, then uh, her ACLU lawyers brought her to the Inter-American Commission on human rights, which found that the United States had violated her human rights. Not the same as getting a federal court judgment, but important. It can also be important in state commissions and in uh, cities. There are cities with human rights commissions. There are state courts and state commissions. Um, actually, many states do have a right to life. And it's not just in the context of abortion. 34 states have a right to life, 32 of which are really quite important. And at least some state judges have been willing to say, well, you have to balance the Second Amendment against a right to life. And so this was sort of the needle in the haystack case that we found out of Indiana. Court of Appeals, not where we expected to find it, actually. I've been doing a project looking at jurisprudence all over the United States to see, are there state courts that are willing to take some of the other rights and balance them so that you don't have this sort of Second Amendment conversation happening in a vacuum where it's not actually taken into conjunction with the others? And finally, you have advocacy. And I, I'll stop there. The US Human Rights Network has picked up this language. Senator Warren has picked 
picked up the language of human rights. Lots of organizations are now picking up the language of human rights. And you have, and this is my last point, a very interesting litigation that was just brought by Mexico against Smith & Wesson and several other gun manufacturers arguing that they had violated Mexican law, international law, and state law. I'm working on the international law part of that team. Mexico has very, very strict gun laws and the um, states that border Mexico are awash in guns, essentially, and Mexico's claim is that the guns are being trafficked illegally into Mexico, uh, knowingly by gun manufacturers that are actually directing them towards Mexico. And so this is another very, it's, it's on summary judgment now, hopefully the lawsuit will survive summary judgment, but there have been some very interesting both advocacy and legal strategies around trying to use some of the international law to uh, get at the U.S. gun violence crisis. So I think I'll stop there. I know we have another really wonderful paper, and thank you so much for allowing a human rights lawyer to come to the, to the conference, and I look forward very much to your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor Siegel and Blunker, how do you? We're going to share this. Can okay. people hear me? Whoever starts, starts. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to, we're, we're going to tag team this. So. Um, I'm going to start out by sharing thanks uh, to Jake and the Duke Firearms Center and to the students who put this or hosting this for the Harvard Law Review and to Mark and to the panelists. And really, I thought there were a wonderful set of papers today. So to everyone who pulled these remarks together. So this afternoon in our joint remarks, Joseph and I will be discussing uh, the amicus brief that was filed by the black legal aid attorneys and the public defenders in the Bruin case, um, a brief that's going to be the subject of conversation in the last panel, as I understand it today. The public defenders um, uh, supported the case for gun rights to dramatize the harms of racism and gun regulation. And the brief poses the question, is racism and gun regulation so severe as to justify this is a public defender's asking the Supreme Court to knock out gun licensing laws under the Second Amendment. We were drawn to the brief's questions because we, in some sense, already were writing about the puzzle of uh, the underlying uh, problems that they grow out of. Um, what does public safety, in its deepest <coughs> sense, mean? What is or ought to be the relationship between public safety and racial justice? And what institutions can or will uh, address these concerns, specifically the intersection between public safety and racial justice. So uh, the more we uh, wrestled with writing our essay for this conference, the more this last question, the institutional question, emerged as its core question. Um, it was unexpected for the public defenders to align themselves with the NRA um, in this Second Amendment conflict but their turn to the Supreme Court for relief in a racial justice case is, in some important sense, a familiar posture, um, a deeply familiar posture in the American legal system, the American constitutional order. And our message in this paper, uh, I suppose, as we thought about it over, I don't want to say how many drafts, <laughs> is uh, do not look to the federal courts even where questions of racial justice are concerned, or maybe especially where questions of racial justice are concerned. Um, that's importantly because of who is sitting in the federal bench right now, um, but it's also, there's a second part to this, it's also because of the limited toolkit that judges can bring to the project of racial repair. So it's a two-part message, it's not just because of who's been appointed, but also because of what courts can do. And uh, as Reva's introduction there suggests, this is a, a nuanced project with a lot of moving pieces, but one basic proposition I think that we can start with, which is relatively straightforward, is that like any instrument of power, guns and their regulation can be used either uh, for purposes of oppression or purposes of liberation and freedom, uh, including along lines of race and gender and class. Um, and in our prior work, including the Northwestern Law Review article, which um, Reva mentioned earlier, 
we have tried to capture what we understand the stakes to be of the court's expansion of gun rights in the home, which is the Heller paradigm to gun rights outside the home, which is what I think we expect the outcome to be in uh, the Bruin case. And in particular, what we've tried to do is to make uh, uh, concrete and constitutional um, the, the government's interest in protecting public safety as more than uh, physical safety, that is sort of physical integrity of the body, but also to uh, include uh, the very preconditions of public collective life, uh, what we've called the body politic, in other work, which includes democratic engagement, free from terror, as uh, Frenita was describing on the first panel, or as Layla, I think, just po just really powerfully illustrated the right to uh, attend school, free from terror, not just uh, the right to attend school and not be and not be shot. Uh, we show that District of Columbia versus Heller recognizes the government's prerogative to protect members of the public, not just from physical harm, but from weapons threats. And we argue that government must promote public safety in such a way as uh, to protect the public sphere on which a constitutional democracy depends. And crucially, this goes back a little bit to Reva's exchange with Adam earlier, uh, that means regulating so as to ensure that all persons have equal claims to security and to the exercise of liberties uh, whether or not they are armed and however they might differ by race or gender or uh, class or, for that matter, political viewpoint. That is, racial and political even-handedness has to be a central part of all conversations about the passage and enforcement of gun laws and about killings in self-defense. So again, to Reva's exchange with Adam earlier, we do think that equality principles are baked into the Second Amendment. We worry that uh, 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 the judicial expansion of the right to keep and bear arms actually can threaten to undermine those equality principles. And that's one reason why we were so struck by uh, the public defender's brief, which you've heard um, a lot about already and will be the focus of the fourth panel. But it's worth, I think, saying more about the powerful argument that the brief makes. So the brief points to racialized patterns in the exercise of government discretion. It describes a regime in which the state of New York disproportionately denies gun licenses to people of color and then disproportionately prosecutes people of color for having guns without a license. Um, as one of the authors of the brief put it in a separate article, New York has total discretion over whether you can possess a firearm at all anywhere. And what's happening is that the NYPD is marching around the city taking firearms from black and brown people every single day. Um, to put this in uh, terms of the metaphor that uh, Sasha Natapoff used on the last panel, if we think about this in terms of the Scylla, the Scylla and Charybdis, the Scylla is what the public defenders show us here, which is the inequitable and inefficient carceral system that ensnares so many of their clients, so many people in New York and across the country. Uh, the pattern of law enforcement they depict derails lives and families. Uh, it undermines public safety rather than promoting it. And here's just uh, quoting, I think, some powerful language from the brief. It is not safe to be approached by police on suspicion that you possess a gun without a license. It is not safe to have a search warrant executed on your home. It is not safe to be caged pre-trial at Rikers Island. It is not safe to lose your job. It is not safe to lose your children. It is not safe to be sentenced to prison. OK, so. The public defender's brief recounts stories of racialized encounters with the law, spotlighting racial bias in gun licensing and in the enforcement of criminal law. The, not, the natural doctrinal home for this kind of argument would seem to be the Equal Protection Clause, the, quote, central purpose of which, in the court's own language, is to address, quote, official conduct discriminating on the basis of race. The constitutional evaluation of a licensing law like New York's allegedly enforced in a race-based manner is not a new problem for the for, for 14th Amendment doctrine. And yet the public defenders make no mention of the Equal Protection Clause. One obvious explanation is that, thanks to doctrinal changes advocated and implemented by conservative justices, it's nearly impossible to prevail on an equal protection challenge to the enforcement of a criminal <coughs> law like New York's. <clears throat> The court has required plaintiffs to prove that the enforcement of the law is motivated by discriminatory purpose and then went on to define discriminatory purpose standards in terms that are virtually impossible to satisfy. Federal courts have been especially resistant to statistical evidence of discriminatory purpose in the criminal law context where justices have emphasized that this method of, e of proving equal protection violations could limit prosecutorial discretion. It's therefore striking that during oral argument in the Bruin case, some justices were receptive to the claim that government discretion in gun licensing is inconsistent with the protection constitutional rights deserve. We would be amazed if these same justices attack doctrines that protect prosecutorial discretion in cases alleging selective prosecution 
on the basis of race or political viewpoint. So concern about discretion in one context, not matched, we assume, in another. Few would dispute the public defender's core claim. Communities seeking relief from gun violence should not have to accept public safety regimes rife with racial bias. And yet because of the ways the Supreme Court itself has interpreted the Equal Protection Clause, federal courts are not likely to provide relief from the forms of racial bias that the public defenders describe. So because of this doctrinal dead end, um, presumably, or at least in part, the public defenders channel their argument instead into the Second Amendment. And it is here that um, despite our um, uh, support for the basic diagnosis and um, our belief in the essential relationship between equality and the Second Amendment, we reluctantly part ways. Uh, again, not with the diagnosis, but with the proposed remedy, which is judicial expansion of the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that whatever Second Amendment victory is achieved for the petitioners in Bruin is going to come at the cost of the democratic authority of communities to protect themselves through law, including the communities of color that are most ravaged by gun violence. Now, depending on how the court rules in Bruin and what the precise holding is, the holding could provide at least some remedy, some relief for um, the uh, public defenders clients, but it's going to do so, I think, inevitably in ways that impose substantial costs on others. Uh, experience, including with expansion of Stand Your Ground and self-defense doctrines, some of which you've heard today, um, suggests that they tend to privilege white defendants and white gun carriers. I suspect the same thing would happen post-Bruin. But whether or not that bias persists, expanding Second Amendment rights to favor those who wish to defend themselves with guns necessarily restricts the ability of communities to defend themselves with law and evidence suggests that communities of color particularly highly value self-defense through law. So a recent poll found that about eight in 10 black adults say gun violence is a very big problem, by far the largest share of any racial or ethnic group. A different poll found that majorities of black adults, about 75%, 72% of Asian adults, and 65% of Hispanic adults say that gun laws should be stricter compared with just 45% of white adults. Now, uh, if we mentioned earlier the sort of scylla, um, the Charybdis comes into line when you think about the fact that communities of color suffer vastly disproportionate harm from gun violence. Black Americans uh, uh, comprise about 13% of the American population and about 59% of gun homicide victims. Black males ages uh, 14 to, uh, 15 to 34 make up 2% of the nation's population and about 37% of its gun homicide victims. Uh, losses of that kind make firearm violence a racial justice crisis as well as the racial justice crisis, again, the Scylla and Charybdis here, of, uh, of over-policing and over-carcerization. Now, none of this means, to be very clear, that communities must accept carceral approaches to gun violence, that, to gun regulation rather, that are themselves infected with racial racial bias. Public safety, like gun violence, is a civil rights issue. In a constitutional democracy, public safety protects the public sphere in which all have a right to participate. And when we confront evidence of the kind that the brief presents, that existing public safety regimes deliver security along the lines of race, sex, and class, then the commitment to equal participation makes clear why we have to reimagine and transform those regimes so that they deliver more inclusive forms of public safety that alleviate rather than aggravating existing status inequality. The question, of course, the hardest one, which Layla's posed and people have posed throughout the day, is how to get there. Uh, one route is through uh, the elimination of gun licensing for public carry nationwide through judicial decree, not through politics. That's what the Bruin petitioners are asking. As we see it, democratic competence is exactly what is needed to pursue and coordinate racial justice goals. The question is not whether democratic actors are currently uh, always choosing or properly coordinating their, those ends. There can't be any doubt that politics has repeatedly failed uh, to deliver racial justice, including and perhaps especially in the context of criminal law. But instead, the question is whether to continue the conversations that have now been ignited or rather to invite federal courts to expand gun rights in ways that take control of decision making out of democratically responsive institutions. So to just one more time revisit Sasha's metaphor of skill and Charybdis, the question for us is, given the existence of these two, which institution is best suited to steer the ship between the two? The current court with its current doctrinal toolkit or democratic actors? There are two bad options, but the question is, which direction do you go? That's what we're talking about here. 
So in urging that the better, not ideal, but that the better path forward lies in democratic politics, we do not leave the Constitution behind. To the contrary, all government actors, not only judges, can enforce the Constitution. And actors in government, in representative government, can do so with institutional resources that, that judges lack. That means, first, that um, actors can do much more than federal courts. Uh, it, it, they'll do what federal courts won't in some locations that we're going to be talking about. And second, that democratic actors can do much more than federal courts can to advance equality in the course of protecting public safety. And we're going to talk about both of these points here. So the most elemental goal is to end discriminatory enforcement of the criminal law that federal courts have for too long refused to oversee. That alone would be huge. So that's a goal. We're not talking about having the answer at our hands, but it's a goal. And there are resources to do this in democratic politics. It would be immense to see it happen, but, and here we want to, we're being short because of time, and we want to have a conversation here, but non-discrimination in law enforcement is not enough. And this is a key term that we make in the essay. Non-discrimination can reduce the disparate burdens of criminal law on communities of color, but it will not eliminate those burdens. Because criminal law tools can damage communities in myriad ways, as the public defender's brief so vividly illustrates, it's critical for those designing public safety strategies to reduce reliance on the criminal law and to involve other parts of the government in implementing policies that prevent violence with the goal of making criminal law the strategy of last rather than first resort. And we're counting this as a key racial justice dimension of this project. <clears throat> Notably, some of these developments are already visible in shifting policy and political priorities. At the national, state, and local level, advocates have sought to de-emphasize prosecution for gun possession crimes and to allocate more resources for background checks or community violence intervention programs, which have been shown to break silence of cycles of violence by connecting high-risk individuals to wraparound social services and including counseling, education, and employment opportunities in the mix, essentially prophylact, proceeding prophylactically rather than after the fact. Such programs are now a centerpiece of the Biden administration's gun violence prevention plan. In some cities, progressive prosecutors have campaigned on proposals for combating gun violence that lead uh, with non-carceral interventions and follow with measured gun, gun control legislation and enforcement policies. And our essay tries to showcase some of these initiatives as constitutional initiatives. Uh, for example, Br uh, Brooklyn DA uh, Eric Gonzalez um, emphasizes that, quote, the choice between safety and constitutional protections, especially in communities of, colors, uh, of color, is a false choice, close quote. And with this understanding of role, the prosecutors are exploring new approaches to uh, securing public safety. In New York, Ma Manhattan DA, uh, Al, 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 excuse me, Alvin Bragg, who's in the news for the reasons right now, uh, was elected on a platform that treats gun violence as, quote, a civil rights and equality issue and as, quote, instructed prosecutors that's to avoid seeking jail time for gun possession in cases where other, no other crimes are involved and to, quote, find alternatives to incarceration, especially for first-time offenders, to the extent consistent with public safety. We, if I had more time, I'd talk, I, th I think especially I'd direct people's attention to Krasner's work in Philadelphia where there's this fascinating 200-page report that's come out in February. If you just Google and find this report, stunning production of information, and you can see warring city agencies talking about how to act on it. I, if, if I would encourage anything, I'd say go look for that report. So there's a accumulating body of research that reducing prosecution and incarceration for certain offenses is both effective, efficient, as well as equitable. And cities are, are weighing in on these constitutionally informed responses to public safety. Of course, and now here's the big of course, as with any reform, there's been growing opposition like a huge amount of opposition. Every city in which you look at these proposals, you'll see that there's resistance inside city agencies, traditionally from entrenched uh, law enforcement initiatives, electoral forms, um, uh, personnel resistance, et cetera. Um, and so there's a sort of resistance and pushback, and there's different um, forms of equilibria being uh, hit in different locations. 
Our point is not that the right equilibrium is being hit in these locations, but that at least government are trying to coordinate non-discriminatory law enforcement and transform less uh, car carceral approaches to public safety and are debating the proper balance between them. And the existence of this conversation, its appearance in these various cities, increasing number of cities, shows that there is at least a degree of democratic responsiveness that's visible and engaged in a way that we're not seeing in our federal courts. And that this, I at least want to spotlight, is a form of constitutional engagement that should be showcased and, and nourished and celebrated and supported. So whatever the deficiencies of these reform efforts, a Supreme Court decree expanding Second Amendment rights is, um, is not, in our understanding, likely to improve on them. It's been decades since our Supreme Court has demonstrated uh, the leadership in the pursuit of racial justice, and uh, we can only imagine what is coming next term in the voting rights and affirmative action uh, areas. So um, while we understand this court is ready to denounce racism, it's usually racism of the past, but when it comes to the form of inequality affecting minority communities in the present, the court too often interprets the Constitution to license inequality and to obstruct efforts to dismantle it. Communities need a wide range of resources to combat gun violence, and critically, they need democratic competence to experiment and to liberate how best to preserve public safety of all of their members when both human life and the shape of constitutional community is at stake. The question of how to deliver public safety equitably and effectively is likely to vary across communities and over time, especially at present, is most likely achieved in politics rather than in courts. <clears throat> So just to close up here, we believe that the public defender's brief in Bruin has undoubtedly helped focused attention, spotlight attention, on the concerns of Americans who for too many years have been marginalized in the courts and in politics. Um, but our concern is that the public defender's appeal to the deregulatory Second Amendment is a vote for expanding the authority of a Supreme Court at a time when it's inclined to restrict the authority of democracy. Our fear is that the court may use claims of racism to justify expanding gun rights in ways that won't address underlying claims of racial injustice and instead restrict a community's authority to respond. There's a role for the court in, in promoting democracy, but the Roberts Court's decisions on guns and race are, do not, are not democracy promoting, and they embody the very forms of judicial overreach against which Caroline Products warned. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank all of the panelists for the very provocative set of papers. Um, are there, uh, I'd like to invite questions and comments from the audience. Uh, and so, yeah, Dara? Yeah, th uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, thanks so much uh, for these papers. Um, and. Um, and for your participation. Um, this is a kind of invitation to think on, um, I think for um, uh, Professor Sadat, um, but everyone on the panel to sort of think about uh, the sort of paradox of positive rights. You know, Joseph and I um, have been talking about what's, what's emerging as a kind of rights versus rights paradigm in a lot of these cases. Um, and your, your presentation, um, uh, made me wonder to what extent do um, international law norms, especially in the area of positive rights, have or can have an influential impact on those kinds of domestic positive rights that we usually don't think about. So you might be uh, familiar with Emily Zakin's book, Looking for Rights in All the Wrong Places, which talks about you know, the states as a storehouse of lots of different positive rights. Um, it, it strikes me that there are um, implied uh, within the federal constitution certain types of positive rights. For example, you know, a, uh, a, um, a uh, requirement to hold elections seems to you know, pr presume that the government has to provide some kind of apparatus for a vote to be registered. Um, I'm, I'm quite high on the, on the premise that a right to peaceably assemble uh, both requires uh, a space that assembly can take place and uh, to have it be peaceable, some mechanism for security. Um, so it's an invitation to think about um, uh, 
the sort of positive rights aspect and its influence uh, on the international stage vis-a-vis uh, -vis sort of domestic uh, legal institutions. Um, one other uh, idea that um, also um, sort of triggered by your, your paper um, was the Deshaney Castle Rock um, paradigm. So when I teach this class, or when I teach this case, my recollection was that one of the unusual aspects of the Castle Rock case was that this particular type of um, restraining order was not treated as if it was a property right by the Supreme Court, just mm -hmm. that it's not a kind of property. Um, and for those of you that are closer to the, the doctrine here, um, why wouldn't a solution to that be uh, simply to uh, have an immediate transfer of title of the actual weapons to mm -hmm. the person that is uh, seeking the restraining order? That is, mm -hmm. the court's really skeptical about liberty interests, but it seems to be more open to property rights. And so if you characterize it as a property right, doesn't that, isn't that an enforcement forcing mechanism? So um, those two thoughts, and I, and I, you know, I look forward to your comments. Um, those are really great points. And they, they sort of go, your last point goes to Eric's point a little bit about workarounds, right? That, that, that you can work around some of these things by mo shifting the terrain to a different branch of law. Um, the one area, to, to go to your first point, I didn't spend much time on this, but I would say the area that we've seen the greatest degree of interreaction between the international and the national space is abolition of the death penalty, where you really had a global abolish the death penalty campaign um, that focused very much on first abolition um, with respect to juveniles, abolition with respect to um, those who had mental defects or diseases. And so in Roper versus Simmons, we saw Justice Kennedy actually pick up the fact that there was this international campaign and uh, make uh, allusion to that, which for which he was criticized by other members of the court. But so, so I don't want to say it's impossible for the international advocacy to percolate into the U.S. legal system and inform thinking here, which is obviously one of the reasons that we do it. And the death penalty has probably been one of the strongest area. I hadn't thought of that with respect to the Castle Rock. I mean, because you just run up against that, that blockage of the Supreme Court seeming completely adverse. And I think that's a really creative workaround, is to say, well, don't focus so much on the liberty interests. Focus on these other interests. At the same time, it is a disappointment pointing case because then it gets picked up even in state court decisions. This idea that government doesn't have affirmative obligations, it only has these obligations to not get in the way. But your point is well taken that how can you have a right to assemble if you don't have a space to do it, et cetera, that in lots of ways these positive obligations exist, we're just not cognizant of them. So thank you. Great points. Yeah. Uh, uh, I got a question for um, Bertrall and then also for, for Layla. Um, for Bertrall, you, you talked about the ways in which um, perhaps courts should defer more uh, when a, a, a state's you know, representative democracy is functioning well. And I'm just wondering if you could talk more about what metrics either courts could use or observers could use to understand when extra deference would apply um, and, yeah, I'm sure it's it's hard to set like uh, you know any kind of definite line, but what kind of measures that courts should be looking at or observers should be looking at when 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 states should get that extra deference? Um, and then for Layla, this is my lack of international law knowledge at all. But is there any way can Congress give a private right of action to enforce a treaty, um, or can can the United States bring an action against a state? Um, I'm I'm thinking of a, a scenario in which let's say a state says um, anyone who's qualified to carry a gun legally can bring their gun into a K through 12 um, educational institution. Could, the, could, could, could Congress authorize a private right of action or could the United States bring, it, uh, bring a case and say, that's preempted by our treaty obligations that don't let us, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what that, that provide for protection of children. Is there any kind of a mechanism by which uh, those treaty obligations could be enforced in a, in a domestic court? Okay. So we're all speaking from the sky. <laughs> hey, hey, thanks for the question. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky 
um, question in terms of how do you define when a government is representative or not, but I'll go to some of the main arguments that the anti-federalists were making at the time and how um, representative government was being defined then, uh, which is in similar terms as we define it now in terms of fair and equal representation. It's really fascinating to see that term cross generations and, and centuries of American history, this notion of fair and equal representation across the different classes. Now, of course, we have to recognize how they define the fair and equal representation then is very different from how we define it now. It was a white male democracy, and so they're thinking very much in economic class terms. We've brought that notion of fair and equal representation to think about um, race, gender, um, orientation, disability, a, a, a variety of different um, characteristics that define us as individuals. So that basic notion, but that basic notion idea of fair and equal representation would, would, would apply. So how do you measure that is a, is a critical question. But what we've seen political scientists do, Martin Jones and Larry Bartle, among others, is measure it in terms of responsiveness to different classes and how responsive legislators are responsive to different classes in society. And what they found, um, strikingly, is that legislators are not at all responsive when they're thinking about it in terms of economic terms to the lower and middle income classes in America and, and very responsive to the wealthy elite. What other scholars have found is that um, politicians are not at all responsive to the racial minorities and very and much more responsive to white voters. And that, to me, is an indicator that democratic politics is just not working. And so to, um, in a sense, um, defer um, when it comes to matters of right um, seems um, problematic in that particular context, especially when you think about the, put the 14th Amendment on top of the Second Amendment and think about its applications of the states. And once you get to the 14th Amendment, the focus is on um, eliminating the racial aristocracy, right? It's an economic class-based aristocracy at the time of the founding that the anti-federalists are concerned about, and the radical Republicans are worried about a racial aristocracy. And what evidence seems to demonstrate is that the racial aristocracy is still quite strong right now. And so providing deference to democratic actors doesn't seem to be the right move at this particular moment. Thanks. Um, so on the, um, can the federal government in, use a treaty to do something it can't do by legislation, which is, it's kind of the Missouri versus Holland case, right? Which is, again, Missouri in the news. But uh, where they wanted to have these migratory bird restrictions, and Missouri was like, we own the birds that are inside our state, and you can't do anything about it. And the Supreme Court said, actually, that's right. You can't do that by legislation. And so the United States entered into a treaty and it's one of the you know famous foreign relations law cases where you know Justice Holmes says that of course the birds are here today and gone tomorrow, and so you can do via the treaty something you couldn't actually do uh, using legislation. Your example cuts much closer to the bone, right? Because this is something you know regulation of schools would be just so something that a state could do. All of our human rights treaties have these non self execution clauses that the Senate attached to them when it ratified. So we couldn't use those. I did see, I think, Jake, and I might be misremembering this, but one of the reasons that President Obama didn't eventually uh, send the arms trade treaty to the Senate was this concern, was that it could have a preemptive effect, uh, in addition to various lobbying that was against it. So that treaty actually is not ratified by the United States, and that could have definitely, and he's using the commerce power, which is exactly what they used in Missouri versus Holland. So that's a really, I hadn't thought about that, but that's a really interesting uh, connection of could the federal government enhance its power to do something about public safety using some of the treaties that haven't yet been ratified. But I. I think the Senate, if it would ever ratify them, would probably figure that out and try to attach all kinds of reservations and understandings. Yeah. Adam, did you have something? After Adam, we have a question from online. So uh, I was going to ask um, uh, Riva and, and, and Joseph um, uh, if uh, are there ways in which we might think that uh, maybe you're, you're too sanguine about legislatures and too suspicious of courts? Um, so one possibility is we, when we see legislators, when they respond to things like the rise in gun violence we've seen recently, what we get is uh, demands for more criminalization, de demands for more police on the streets, demands for more of these measures that will have predictably racially disparate results. Um, that, um, uh, and in contrast, when we, uh, in the courts, uh, the suspicion that you have of courts, I share, and especially uh, how the court has done a poor job with 
racial justice measures uh, in the past. Although I do wonder in the Second Amendment space, uh, we could imagine a Second Amendment, what the expansion of the Second Amendment means. That it means uh, on the ground that uh, this discretionary permitting that, uh, the, uh, that New York has uh, gets uh, struck down. Uh, the discretionary permitting that uh, the, process, the, the public defender's brief does such a, a great job of illuminating its racially disproportionate effects and its uh, uh, adverse effects on communities of color. Um, so we strike down licensing, strike down high capacity magazines. I've made the push and made an argument at least that there's a good chance that's going to have a racially disparate result if we have it. Uh, maybe a, a military style assault weapon. Um, uh, it doesn't seem to me, if those are what we're talking, if that's what we're talking about with the expansion of the Second Amendment, I'm not sure that those expansions um, undermine the goal uh, or the ability of legislatures to seek out racial justice and achieve it. I think some of those things, like a high capacity magazine ban, like a discretionary permitting ban, does have racially disproportionate uh, impacts. It's the kind of thing we should be trying to avoid as a general matter. Um, uh, and so I'm wondering if, if uh, with the general suspicions of the courts uh, uh, recognized, and, uh, but I wonder if in this space, what we're imagining of as a Second Amendment expansion, none of the Second Amendment expansion ideas I've really ever seen would call into question any of the reforms, Reva, that you cited as new reforms of going after gun violence. What they would do is take off the table certain forms of criminalization that have these racially disproportionate results. So I'm just wondering, like, is there a pathway between these two extremes uh, that where we might see legislatures and the courts working together in a way that does reduce at least some racial violence or racial disproportionate results? Well. Do you want to go first? Yeah. OK, so the first thing. Um, first of all, I'm laughing because um, back home, Sam Moyne thinks I'm just the courts person. So <laughs> the idea, because I have not just completely thrown in the towel on judicial review. And so just the idea that um, you're, you're sort of seeing me here as uh, the person who's given up on courts is, it's just ineffably funny. Okay, so that, that's the, it's all relative kind of thing. All right, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing, nothing I am saying is some kind of abstract choice and saying that legislatures are peachy keen when it comes to race. We live in either, you could call it, racist, white supremacist, whatever you want to call it, whatever it is we're in, it affects all institutions, all right? I want to be very clear about that. That's point number two. Point three, the question was in respect of our problems with the strategy in this brief. And we tried to articulate what our problem was with the strategy in this brief, and it goes beyond that. I would not choose the Second Amendment or the deregulatory Second Amendment as a strategy for redress of racial justice issues, okay? I just would not choose that path. I would think as clearly as I could about equal protection vindicated in whatever institutions were at my command. I would not hand to courts populated by the Federalist Society I would not throw my weight with them as a strategy for achieving uh, repair of the institutions we're talking about. So I don't, um, I don't, I do think that there's an immense case to be made for changing f public safety law and in the gun regulation space starting. And that's, we tried to say that about the public defender's brief. That's, that was our A number one statement, and we say so in the paper. And that's the, if you will, the brilliance of the brief, that it draws, you know, puts directly an issue. That's, that puts that agenda on the table. And so if by what you're saying, Adam, uh, the Second Amendment is going to be a cure for <clears throat> racial injustice because it's going to strike down some gun regulation laws, maybe. But I think many things are going to go in their place. And what's going to go in their place is not going to be put in their place with a concern with racial justice moving them. I worry about that in some sense. Well, I, I don't want to bring Aziz's paper into view, so maybe I'll 
Uh, I'll bring Aziz's paper, <laughs> um, but first a, a few, a few, a few very quick, quick hit responses. I mean, on the on the specific New York law as currently administered with this wide discretion, I would not lose a whole lot of sleep if New York had to tighten up how that law is uh, is administered. I think that would be okay. I, I do think, though, that public law, public carry restrictions, including May issue, are are, are more important. Maybe I, I think they're more important than it sounds like you do. I mean, this is the eighty million people live under these laws, and there's pretty good data, including John Donahue's study in Missouri to mention Missouri again, uh, about what happens when they get loosened up is that is the, is the, the people die. I also worry that, you know, Bruin is going to be about more than that, just like Heller was about more than handguns in the home, and that whatever Bruin does is going to call into question other kinds of restrictions, like we could see from oral argument. The court, the justice is trying to figure out, well, what about Times Square? What about campuses? What about, like, those, are, those I worry about a little more than whether the New York law in its current form um, uh, uh, gets uh, gets upheld. I mean, can, can I just say that? And they're not going to pick which ones with a racial justice agenda on as a lens. I guess that's what I'm going to say. In other words, when new laws are pulled into issue on the Second Amendment grounds, the racial justice question is not going to be the selection device. Some other set of criteria are going to be the criteria. And so that's, that's where I guess, no, I mean, I think that's where we could fold in Aziz and Eric's papers from the last panel. And maybe this makes us even mm -hmm. more negative and more um, pessimistic going forward. But like, I think what Eric's paper shows is you do away with licensing laws and don't address the underlying problem of racial bias, this stuff is just going to, it's just, you're going to put a rock in the stream and it's going to move and you're going to find people prosecuted for other crimes besides the licensing crimes. Like that has, that requires a different kind of remedy than just expanding gun rights. I mean, I, I think that a, a positive result for the petitioners in Bruin actually could work than the problems that Aziz describes, because after all, what he's talking about is not just police enforcing a public licensing restriction, but rather using politics to get bigger budgets and put more cops on the street and you know you throw away on the weight of the police state. The, the, they are able to do that because they can waive the sort of fear of guns in public life. Bruin makes that easier for them. Like if Bruin, if the petitioners win in Bruin, I think the, the police state has a stronger claim now that we need more props, we need more, and that could make things even worse. So um, I'm not sure which, which, what that makes us optimistic or pessimistic but, about. It's just I really <laughs> worry about, all right, here, I'm going to try to put this gently. I was thinking about this in, at lunch. The frame, racist gun control laws, or right, like I worry about that because... So many laws could be described in those terms. Like, why start there? I mean, why stop there? Why not just keep going? So that's one description of a problem, but we live in a society in which so many laws are enforced with a bias, you know? And so the thought that just knocking out that law is going to knock out a problem, what makes you think that? Um, the problem... This could help alleviate one part of that problem. Not a cure-all, not going to solve a racial justice problem. The point is, why wouldn't we try to eliminate a racial injustice in a spot where we see it? Well, I guess, and this goes to something that I was talking about with Eric earlier about self-defense law, you actually need a race-conscious remedy in a certain way. In other words, because of the character of the bias, repair, you, you actually need to understand what's going wrong in order to fix it in some way. In other words, the agents who are enforcing the neutral law need to know the character of the, hist the institutional biases and the problem of a wrong in order to sort of make sure that the way that the institution's running is not reproducing what Aziz was calling the the disparate impact or the unconscious bias or something. So in order to, to sort of knock the institution out of its historic patterns, you actually need to recognize the way the machine's been running in order to cause it not to, to cause it to shift into some other gear or down some other track, or so I believe. And that's nothing this court wants to hear about. But that that's my belief that one needs, I don't know how that gets institutionalized, but to deinstitutionalize these patterns, I think you really need to recognize that they're patterns and to have a commitment that they cease being those patterns for them to stop running that way. That's my intuition about it. So, so we have about 90 seconds left. Um, I want to make sure that we get our one of our online uh, viewers um, submitted a question. I just want to read that. It's for Professor Sadat. Um, are there federal and state laws that may establish the kind of positive obligations that you discussed in relation to the international treaties that could be used to encourage policymaking bodies to enact gun violence prevention policy? 
Um, that's a pretty broad question. <laughs> Are there federal and state laws that could be used to? Well, n n the treaty, the human rights treaties, no, uh, not really. The, what's interesting is on the criminal treaties, like the torture convention, there are actually, there's the Torture Victim Protection Act. There are lots of laws like that that actually have federal legislation implementing the treaties. We don't have any implementation by legislation of the human rights treaties, unfortunately. Although there are some states, San Francisco has a human rights commission. We do have some city human rights laws, and some states have much broader constitutions. Um, but we don't, unfortunately, have direct implementation of the international law through our national systems. So it's all indirect. A few, just a flip it, yeah. a few states have um, injunctions against uh, requirements that states consider whether a statute will have yes. disparate impact before enacting it. And so that sort yeah. of incorporates this form of consciousness into the deliberative process. It's almost like, you know, as, as a, a procedural matter. And so that's something that could yeah. be more broadly enacted to sort of put a break on this dynamic that Adam, you and I were just dialoguing about. So I'm gonna uh, conclude this, but take like 60 seconds of moderator's privilege to make two observations. One is that um, I think it would be interesting to put you two in dialogue with you and Robert Post. That is, um, <laughs> uh, you two can figure that out. <laughs> and, um, that dialogue would be a both and dialogue rather than an either or dialogue. Um, second thing, I want to go back to where we began. Uh, I, it struck me that the modern, I, you know, there's a form of constitutional argument that would update what Professor Ross argued by saying that the contemporary analog of the Second Amendment as a defense against uh, a defense of the unpropertied against an aristocratic elite, the modern analog of that would be the Second Amendment, this gets back to Denzel Washington as the equalizer, uh, a defense of the you know, uh, um, uh, subordinated communities, describe them however you want, against the depredations of the male, heterosexual, white elites. Um, and, and that's the narrative Oh, I mean, it's literally the narrative of the Denzel Washington movie. Uh, um, so, okay. Uh, thank you all, the participants, the audience.